my name is Lucy. I'm one of five mechanical circulatory support coordinators here at Banner University Medical Center, Phoenix. Um, mechanical circulatory support or MCS is kind of our new name rather than LVAD coordinator that you've probably heard in the past. That's because we use two different devices now, one that supports the left side and then something called a total artificial heart that we'll review a little bit today. If anybody has questions throughout this or has stories they want to share, please butt in. I know it's difficult doing virtual learning, sometimes getting that um, well-rounded learning experience. So our objectives today are to introduce MCS devices, equipment and functions, discuss appropriate patients assessment and management, identify alarms and emergencies, common complications, and how to contact us, the MCS coordinators. So assessing and managing VAD patients can be challenging and may not follow the routine EMS protocols. Um, we strongly recommend that whenever you go into a patient's home or out in the field, when you see them, if they have an LVAD or an artificial heart to look at their equipment, see what program they belong to, and then call the hotline. No matter what hospital program they belong to, there are coordinators at their designated to take care of those patients. So we'd like first responders to utilize the hotline for um, before and during every encounter or transport. I've been on the phone with somebody for probably 40 minutes before for the whole shebang, getting, guiding, assisting, and helping them get over to the ER. Um, our, so BUMCP, our hospital, has a program, as you many of you know, we have about 45 patients on support in the community, including three artificial hearts, we have an RN VAD coordinator on call 24 hours a day. Um, you can program in your cell phone if you want our emergency line of 602-819-7910. But the picture on this slide shows that the back of all of the controllers that the patients have for their equipment has our emergency contact on it as well. This number rings right to a person. There's no automated system to go through or operator. And we are all trained in emergencies. Um, Tucson has a program as well, and they use medical alert bracelets, and their phone number is on there. They have engineers, so I believe that they go through a call system, and you get a call back within five minutes. St. Joseph's also has a VAD program. Um, their stickers are on their system controllers as well. Their patients also usually have a backpack with a hanging tag. Um, our patients at BUMCP also have a hang tag on their emergency equipment. And then Mayo Clinic has a hotline as well that routes you through an operator. And within five minutes, the um, coordinator will call you back. Oh, under two minutes, sorry. <clears throat> um, the hotline is for patients, caregivers, first responders, and consults to use for both emergency and non-emergent needs. Um, when we teach our patients, we teach them, if you're going to call 911, call 911, then call us right away so that we're in the loop, we're aware of what's going on, we can help get that patient packed up and kind of in a prettier package before you guys get there. So what is a VAD? Um, a VAD is technically, a, an LVAD is a left ventricular assist device designed to support the left side of the heart. So it's a mechanical circulatory support device, restores blood flow and improves survival, functional status and quality of life from those who suffer from advanced heart failure. Most of our patients are kind of older in age that have had heart failure for a long time and despite be seeing their doctor being on medications as they're just directed, still not having a good quality of life. That would be a trigger for a patient to have an LVAD. Um, the device is implanted with an open heart surgery and it takes over the majority of the circulatory function of the patient. Um, like I said, we have multiple devices. Each of our little figures on the side here are, have a different technical device, although they're all still LVADs. Um, we don't have an age limit, especially at our program. Um, we don't have children here, but Phoenix Children also does implants for their kiddos uh, while waiting for a transplant. We have implanted people in their 20s all the way up to an 80, 80 years old. So we have a wide range of patients. Um, the VAD is implanted in heart failure patients, like I said, augments function of the ventricles and circulating blood. And sometimes it's temporary and sometimes it's designed as a permanent treatment. So we have patients who are in their 20s, 30s who get a really bad virus. And then their cardiac function six months later is severely impacted and they're in profound heart failure at the age of 30. 
So these devices can be used as a bridge while they're listed and waiting for a heart transplant, but not well enough to provide support to the rest of their body at the time. Um, you can see a good picture over there. The um, inflow cannula goes into the left ventricle, the blood goes down in through the motor, and then goes up that little tube to the aorta, and that's how it provides blood flow. The outflow graft that anastomoses to the aorta lines up just below the ascending arch, so or the aortic arch, so the blood it ejects right where the valve na natively would. So we have two different indications for LVADs, like I just mentioned, bridge to transplant. So a patient must be listed for a heart transplant, not being evaluated. Um, and then we take the LVAD out at the time of transplant. Then there are des the destination therapy. Sorry, my mouth is having a hard time today. Destination therapy is patient doesn't qualify for a heart transplant, whether that's age or multiple comorbidities. Um, they are not gonna be able to get a heart transplant, so they're gonna live the rest of their life with the LVAD, however long that may be. We have a patient who's had his device for eight years, and then we share care with a patient who's had his HeartMate 2 since the trial, I wanna say in like 2009, 2010, he's had his device a very long time and he's doing fine. Um, and then we have bridge to recovery. So we don't really use this indication quite so much because now there are temporary devices that a patient can use in the intensive care unit, but they used to implant VADs for weeks or days to provide temporary support, um, like after a woman has a baby and then they have heart failure. Ideally, that heart failure will improve quickly, so then this is a temporary measure. But like I mentioned, we are not using that one quite so much. And regardless, when you go and see a patient in their home, their designation is, doesn't really matter what you're seeing them. Special considerations, um, that patients are unique, they're a little special, and they require some special care. Um, routine assessments, such as blood pressure, pulses, and pulse ox, might not be attainable or reliable. Chest compressions, um, this is kind of changing, but chest compressions are usually not indicated. And then patient carries external equipment um, to operate their internal device. And then they have a wire that comes through the abdomen that called the drive line that has all moves the power back and forth between the pump and the outside pieces. So when you first of all, when you're gonna assess your patient, you're gonna assess them like anybody else. Are they awake? Are they alert? Are they oriented? What color are they? Are they blue? Okay. They're still gonna have respiratory problems like every other patient, but their cardiac issues might not be the reason that they're calling you. So one way to assess them always is you can also take over the left apex and you'll be able to hear a hum rather than a heart beating all the time. A lot of the times in the hospital, we joke with the nurses that the patients are clear over bad when we talk about their lung sounds because it's difficult to hear beyond the hum. Um, so you first thing when you walk into the house, say, is my patient alert? Are they oriented? Okay, if not, is my pump on? And one way to assess that is to listen to the chest. Um, if you can see where it says skin exit site pointing to that um, little wire, that is the drive line that runs from the pump inside the chest to the external equipment. Okay, that external equipment is a little computer and batteries that power the internal pump. That is called the drive line. I like to emphasize that because patients will often wear clothing over top of their um, drive line and you won't necessarily see it. So if you're in a situation where you're cutting somebody's clothes off, it's extremely important to pay attention for that drive line. If that drive line gets cut a little bit, there are backup features in it to um, make up for that. However, if it gets completely severed, that pump is off and that patient is going to be in bad shape very quickly. Um, most of our patients also have defibrillators. So um, you'll be able to sometimes see those the raised part on the left side of the upper chest. Um, a patient might not have one if they're younger and aren't getting their LVAD waiting for a transplant if they're a newer diagnosis, but most of our patients who have had heart failure for a long time will also have a defibrillator because that's part of heart failure treatment. So auscultating over the apex. This little box here kind of shows how a heart rate two motor works. The um, 
inflow cannula, like I mentioned, is inserted into the left ventricle. The blood moves from the LV down in through the, mo in through the motor. Um, the heartmate too is an axial flow, kind of works like a rotor rooter in forcing the blood out. And then it goes out of the outflow graft into the aorta. And then you can see it's called a percutaneous lead on here, but we call it a drive line. And that's where it connects inside the chest. So you're not gonna see that when you're seeing your patient, okay? The drive line typically comes out of the right lower quadrant. But when you listen to the chest, like this slide says, you're gonna be able to hear that motor going. Um, yeah, and they're continuous flow devices. I don't think I mentioned that. So they don't, they're not pulsatile. Um, it's going to be always moving the blood. So patient assessment, like I mentioned, some things are going to be a little bit different than your regular patients. Some things are going to be the same. Some things are going to be different. One was a blood pressure. Um, automatic blood pressure cuffs are unreliable on these patients because, like I mentioned, they have continuous flow. So they're never in a true diastole during their cardiac cycle because even if their valve is opening and closing, that cannula is always draining the blood. So they're constantly unloading that ventricle. So they can never have a true diastole. So they're not going to have a diastolic pressure. But we all know that um, non-invasive blood pressure machines will give you a number pretty much all the time, even if it's right or not. So ideally these patients are gonna have a blood pressure taken with a manual cuff. How we take it here in the hospital is we listen with a Doppler rather than a stethoscope. Um, but again, Realistically, if you go into a patient's home and they're in bad shape and you need a blood pressure, you're not gonna hurt them by putting the blood pressure cuff on. Um, if you're concerned that they're not perfusing, absolutely check a blood pressure. And most, I know most um, EMS and first responders do not have um, Dopplers to listen to the blood pressure in the home. Um, a pulse, so a pulse might not always be palpable on a patient because of that continuous flow. Ideally, we want their aortic valve opening every about third beat. So realistically, when you're palpating, occasionally you might feel a small pulse, but if the VAT is doing its job, you won't feel one. So therefore, a pulse ox can be unreliable. Um, if the patient has cooler extremities in addition to that continuous flow, that number is probably not accurate. However, their waveforms are. So if you're able to see your SpO2 pleth, that will be accurate. So if you go, oh, my number is about 80 and I have a good pleth, it's probably accurate. Um, so you're going to use your physical assessment skills and look for signs and symptoms of deoxygenation. Are their lips blue? Um, that circle moral cyanosis is a big, a big thing with our patients. Um, a lot of the times they'll get those blue clubbing fingers too. Most of our patients have comorbidities, including COPD. Um, so in this situation, if you want to get this blood pressure checked or you have questions about the patient's normal, they're always supposed to have a trained caregiver with them. That caregiver knows all about their equipment. They know all about emergency response. They're typically able to check a blood pressure for you or with you. So use your resource that is the family member. Um, EKGs are typically unaffected with LVAD patients. Okay, this is gonna be different for artificial hearts. But for LVADs, their EKGs are um, accurate. There might be quite a bit of artifact, so moving leads might be necessary. Uh, and these patients are at a high risk for bleeding complications. They all take Coumadin, a blood thinner, as well as at least one antiplatelet medication, such as aspirin. So things like trauma, falls, um, we pretty much advise our patients to come in with all of these, whether it's a planned visit or an ER visit to get scanned and make sure that they don't have a head bleed. Uh, there also is a complication of GI bleeding. That continuous flow from the device puts a lot of pressure on the delicate blood vessels in the GI tract. That GI tract really likes a pulsatile blood flow, but we don't give it that. So AVMs can easily form in the gut and then given their blood thinner use, can be very prone to GI bleeding. So we try not to have to have an EMS or first responder involved GI bleed. We tend to be able to manage that without. But if the patient has lots of vague symptoms, not feeling well, lethargic, um, just kind of blah, often they might be having a GI bleed and they just haven't had their first melanoma stool yet um, or something like that. Again, our patients also get their blood 
their blood checked every month. So we're able to kind of keep track of bleeding issues ahead of time. Um, so trauma and falls would be pretty much the big thing that you guys would see in this respect. Um, rhythm assessment. Because they have a blood pump, the patient might be more stable in VTAC or VFib. They can tolerate dysrhythmias significantly better than your non vatted patient. Their flows might be affected if they're sustaining in that dysrhythmia, but I, we had a patient who is from Bullhead City, and he called us saying, you know, I'm having some diarrhea, and I just don't feel very well. I don't really know what's going on. So we advised him to go to the um, emergency room that's in Bullhead City. They've seen him before, and they're well aware of him. And they said, yeah, he doesn't look good. We want to send him down to you guys so you can evaluate him. So they airlifted him to Phoenix. Um, he went right to the ICU, we put a monitor on him, and he was completely asystolic. So backtracking, we kind of figured out that it, he had been like that for about 48 hours of not feeling well or having severe bradycardia. Um, he did not, not have a pacemaker. This was a newer diagnosis for him when he had his LVAD. So he's sitting there talking to us on a monitor with an occasional P wave saying, I don't feel very well. So he bought himself a pacemaker. Um, he also had some acute kidney injury after that and had a short stint of outpatient dialysis. And now he's doing fine at home. We also had a young guy who was in VTAC for about eight months before he got his transplant. And he would just sit there talking to you in a slow VT at about 110. And it was real terrifying for all of us involved, but he tolerated it okay. Um, persistent arrhythmias are treated after contacting us. So if you come into the home and you see that our patients in, um, well, I think there's a caveat to that. If you walk into the home and you put the leads on and the patients in VFib, obviously you're going to be doing ACLS protocol, but we also, we want you to be calling us. Okay. So we can talk to you and say, all right, well, let's see if the LVAD is on. Cause typically if the LVAD is on, even with that dysrhythmia, they're having cardiac output. So we might be able to give them some medication and then shock them out of it rather than just shocking them out of it while they're awake, if that makes sense. Um, like I mentioned before, many patients have an ICD or pacemaker. Um, if you're with a patient and their ICD delivers a shock, please call us. Um, you are okay to defibrillate and cardiovert per ACLS protocol, all right? That is not going to harm the patient and it's not going to harm the device. And it is also okay to administer antiarrhythmic medications. Some of these patients are more prone to dysrhythmias because that inflow cannula is in the left ventricle. And where we, when we put it in the apex, we're actually pouring out a hole right where the perjunky fibers are. So there's a higher chance that there might have some bundle branch blocks and some wide complex um, tachycardia. So patient has a dysrhythmia, contact your coordinator and treat the patient not the monitor. But like I said, you walk in, the patient's in VFib not responding, I really hope you're gonna shock them. Neurologically, all patients are on anticoagulation, so they're at a higher risk for stroke, both embolic and hemorrhagic. Part of our teaching for these patients is monitoring for those signs and reporting them to us immediately. Like I mentioned before, we monitor lots of blood work on these patients. Um, their coagulation factors we monitor weekly and a full set of blood every month. So if their Coumadin, their INR, if that level is too low, we'll typically bridge them on Lovenox at home to prevent that embolic stroke. Um, level of consciousness, consciousness might deteriorate rapidly on these patients and because they're anticoagulated, they don't typically follow a routine stroke protocol. Um, so we won't be giving any kind of clot busters in the field or anything like that. Most of them already take aspirin daily. Big thing with stroke, let me see what my next one says. Um, these patients have to go to their VAD center, not the closest stroke center. And I know that seems a little bit strange and against all the training you've ever had. However, we are the only banner hospital in the system who takes care of LVAD patients. So say you're in the West Valley or you guys are out in Mesa. So say you're out in Mesa, you get a, a stroke, a stroke alert on a patient. You want to bring them in, even though desert is closer, or a stroke center is right down the street. Those patient, 
they can't take care of the LVAD and they don't know all of the intricacies of anticoagulation with that patient. So then they're gonna have to transfer them to us, which is gonna provide a significant delay in care. So I believe it's part of the, um, the guidelines for you guys from the Arizona Department of Health that patient goes to their center, not the closest stroke center. Um, in regards to that too, if you say our center is closest, but they're a patient of say Mayo's, you can absolutely bring them to our center. We can treat that patient. We prefer that they go to their, their center, but if we're talking 20, 30 minutes of longer transport, then that's a discussion that we can have. But you'll know all this because you have already spoken to us on the phone by this point. If you're in the home, you're assessing your patient, you're calling us, you're involving the family, um, and then we make the plan kind of together. Also, side note, sorry, I don't like PowerPoints. I get a little too tangential for them. But we also have iPhones. All of our banner phones are iPhones. So if you're calling us and we're having um, and you're with one of our patients, we can FaceTime with you. Um, we also, most of us have um, Google phones also, so we can also duo on our personal phones. If you're in a situation and you're not sure what you're seeing or assessing, we can, we can do that with you. We've done that in the past. So bad management, allow the patient and the caregiver to guide your interaction with the device. Like I mentioned, they are the experts. They have extensive training before they go home. They live with this every day. They know all about their devices. So if you're not sure about what you're seeing or doing, even though you're gonna be calling us, involve that spouse or caregiver. Their batteries and controller need to be within reach and secure to the patient, okay? They're really heavy. So if we go to move the patient and we leave them over there, where we're gonna be pulling at that drive line and causing a higher chance that they're gonna get an infection. Um, you can administer, flu administer fluid boluses and pressors as you would with any other patient, especially if they have signs of inadequate perfusion. We prefer not to do sublingual nitro on our patients. Um, that It decreases um, venous return, so then they're not getting enough blood through their VAD, so then their cardiac output actually goes down to their coronary arteries. So it's not going to be as effective as with your typical patient. Um, you can give a fluid bolus, always a great plan. Probably not a liter over 20 minutes, if you know what I mean, but um, we can discuss that too. We can talk to you, we can talk to the family, see how much the patient's been drinking and the, the symptoms leading up to calling 911 um, before we give them too much fluid. Because even though they're supported with this device, they still have end stage heart failure. They still can't handle too much fluid, but they'll need some fluid. So to assess these guys for hypovolemia, when we talk about flow, that is gonna be on the device of the controller. But honestly, it's not gonna matter so much for you guys. Like I said, the family's there, they know more about the flow. And you can also be thinking, my, if your device is alarming, then we're having a problem, okay? So our normal flow for these patients is four to six liters a minute from their device. Ideally, they're asymptomatic. However, when their flow drops a little, like two and a half to three and a half, they might become symptomatic, dizzy, lightheaded, fatigue, change in level of consciousness. And then if they're low flowing, so less than two and a half liters a minute, you're gonna get an alarm on that controller. It's gonna be loud and it's gonna tell you that they're having a low flow and to call the hospital and we are the hospital. So most importantly, you're gonna be treating your patients. You're gonna treat your patient, not your monitor, not your controller. I mentioned being careful about removing clothing. So these are some pictures um, of a drive line that got cut. And I believe this was the same patient who um, an EMS person did not make, did not cut the drive line. Somebody else cut the drive line. And when they responded, they actually kind of splinted it together with popsicle sticks or tongue depressors and was able to reconnect the wires enough to keep the device running to get the patient to the hospital. That is not required of any of you. That is above and beyond what we would ask anybody to do. So if you go into a home and the drive line is completely severed, any guesses as to what you would do? Anybody? 
call the VAD coordinator right away. <laughs> yes, I love it. Yes, that's going to be your first thing, all right? You're going to call us. We're going to talk about how the patient's doing because when the LVAD stops, does anybody have a guess as to what goes on with the heart if the LVAD stops? What's the heart doing? Well, I would think it was only running on the top part of the heart, not the bottom. Still beating okay. just not effectively. Right. So the heart's still going to be beating. All right. Those ventricles are still squeezing. That right side's completely unsupported on these LVAD patients. So all of their four chambers are still going to be squeezing. So if the device stops for whatever reason, their cardiac function goes back to what it was before, which is garbage, which is why they have an LVAD. So most likely they're going to be symptomatic, not feel well, be look like a low output state, low perfusion, probably start to deoxygenate. So you're right. You're going to call the coordinator. We're going to decide if we need to start CPR because CPR is absolutely indicated in these patients if their device is off. Okay. Um, that changed in the American Heart Association's 2018 guidelines. And I believe the guidelines for you guys have changed as well. So that's our hospital policy. And we will encourage you to do CPR if that patient is unresponsive and their LVAD is off. All right. If their LVAD is still on and they're talking to you, then that's a different story. Then you're going to re be ready for some rapid transport. Okay. Get that patient loaded up. You're probably going to need to treat with fluids, maybe um, pressors, inotropes kind of thing while you get them over to the ER. And if this is during business hours, we're already in the hospital Monday through Friday, eight to five. So we will meet you in the ER. If this is after business hours, we are all on call 24 hours a day. And whoever's on call and you're speaking to will be meeting you and the patient in the ER as well. All of us live within about an hour of the hospital. Um, driveline exit site. So like I mentioned, the driveline site is a sterile dressing. So most importantly, it needs to stay dry and it needs to stay intact. So even if the family's like, I think that they have a horrible driveline infection, you do not assess that, okay? When we open that up to air, especially um, if people, well, now with COVID, everybody's wearing masks, but, <coughs> pardon me, um, if we open it to air and we're breathing on it or we have our hairs falling into it, we're going to severely increase that risk of infection. And this line goes right to their heart. So if they get an infection in their drive line, we're in a bad place. So we want to make sure it's intact and that it's covered and that it's um, dry. All right. We don't want that getting wet. If you're assessing your patient and you notice that it's all kind of torn up, Honestly, it's going to be a case by case situation if we want you to do anything about it, because really it's about the patient's clinical status. If they're having a hard time, who really cares about the driveline at this moment, at the dressing at this moment, get them in the ambulance and get them to the hospital. But if they're kind of stable, we'll say just reinforce it with some tape and then bring them in. Yep, that's a picture of an infected driveline and that one's not even that bad. Um, most of our ad readmissions aren't actually related to their LVAD at all. It's typically related to other things like stroke, um, driveline infection, pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia. Um, and that, that's, those are like the main ones and GI bleeding. So, but you are, if the patient's family is saying, I think they have a driveline infection, even though we don't want you looking at the driveline, you have other clinical indicators for sepsis, okay? Those indicators aren't going to go away, all right? Granted, their cardiac output, it might not suffer because they have that device that's constantly going no matter what. However, they might still be tachycardic, um, febrile, and increased respiratory rate, all the things that are going to trigger you for a septic picture. Um, we kind of talked about bleeding, so related to the anticoagulation and continuous flow. We also have trauma and falls. We had, I think, three subarachnoid hemorrhages this year in our program. It was kind of a rough year, but it is a chronic complication, and we talked to our patients about it on implant, so they're all aware of what they sign up for. GI bleeding we spoke about. And then we might have um, 
they're still able to go into heart failure or exacerbation, right? They still have heart failure, even though they have a device. So we talk a lot about a low sodium diet. If they have a dietary indiscretion, like next week, Thanksgiving won't be bad, but the following week, our service is going to be very busy for all the diet cheaters on Thanksgiving. Bad management. First thing, hey, I think whoever made this slides, which it wasn't me, um, really wants you guys to know that the first thing you're gonna do is call the bad coordinator. So you're gonna verify if chest compressions are indicated, right? Is the pump on or is the pump off? Pump is on, which to know if the pump is on, you can look at the controller or listen to the chest. Um, then we'll know, then we'll kind of go from there if we need to do CPR. Consult your family and caregivers, use the people that you have. Look at the VAD card, all right? Then you'll know which program they're at. Use electrical therapy as you would with any other patient. Um, try to avoid the pads directly over the device. Um, two of our devices, the um, pump is actually directly in the chest. It's not sitting lower. So it's right at that left nipple line. So consider AP pad placement if possible. Sorry, I'm also drinking my coffee. Um, alarms, so general rules, don't freak out. Um, every alarm has a sound, a light associated, and a message about it, regardless of the LVAD that they have. So there's two different kinds of alarms. There's yellow and there's red. So look for your lights. Yellow is caution, attention, okay? Typically, think about it like this. If the patient's having a yellow alarm, it is not going to cause patient harm. So kind of look at it, see what it says. It's typically power related. So making sure that the patient is safely on two um, power sources. Then we have the red alarms, which the color of the messaging will be red. The color of the lights on the controller will be red. And that's an urgent, that's a more serious alarm. Then listen, like I said, everything has a sound. So intermittent beeping is a, is a yellow alarm, a caution, attention. And then the red alarms have a continuous tone. They're very loud. Uh, most of the devices, you can silence the alarm for a certain amount of time, depending on how severe the alarm is. However, you want to be paying attention before you silence it. And then look at the controller because it's going to tell you exactly what the alarm is and basic troubleshooting. All right. Most of the time, because these are designed for patients, the troubleshooting on there will say call hospital or call hospital contact. That's because we don't want the patient doing weird stuff at home. All right, I'm sure you guys have crazy stories of when you've walked into somebody's home and been like, what the heck are you doing in here? So we don't want to give them a little, we try to par back the information a little bit so that they don't end up making bad decisions for themselves. So what if you hear an alarm? Like I said, the hardware device um, flashing red, there's a little triangle on the front of it and that's a high critical alarm. Um, and that's, the VAT is stopped, there's a critical battery or the controller has failed. First, you're gonna check your patient, treat it as indicated. Basically, no matter what device there is, if the drive line is disconnected, you're gonna connect it, all right? Some of it's not rocket science. All of this stuff is designed to be patient friendly. And if you've ever met patients with advanced heart failure, oftentimes um, they have some poor cerebral perfusion for a long time. So their complex thinking isn't always there. So everything we have educationally is designed to be kind of streamlined and easy like that. So if the drive line's disconnected, connect it, all right? We wanna change our batteries one at a time, especially in, we'll just say blanketly, change the batteries one at a time. Go slow, make sure that the patient is connected completely. Um, one of the devices, if both batteries are disconnected, the pump stops. So I'll just teach you that no matter what, every device has two batteries in it. Um, and again, you're going to use your caregiver support. So you're like, crap, I haven't actually touched one of these yet. I don't know how to do that all the way. Use your resources. Use your caregiver to change the batteries. They do it every day. It's their job. Heart rate two and three have very similar, have the same alarms. Um, the biggest one that you would see would be a red heart alarm and that is a low flow. So that if the pump is less than two and a half liters of minute um, or the pump has stopped, the dry line's disconnected or something's wrong, the pump's not working, those are all big red alarms. So what are you gonna do? Check your patient, 
make sure your controller is connected to the drive line, and then treat for low flow or shock, okay? And as always, you're gonna call us. Does anybody have any experience with picking up any of these kinds of patients in their homes? I'll take that as a no. Okay. Um, last little section here is our total artificial heart. So those were all LVADs, all supporting the left ventricle. This is the only surgically implanted pump to provide biventricular support. So both their right and their left side of their heart are not functioning appropriately. It cannot provide cardiac output. So um, this little man here, doesn't look anything like what any of our regular patients look like, as we all know. But the device, the actual total artificial heart is the piece in the chest. You can kind of see um, some beige plastic there. Then they have a, their drive lines come out of their sub xiphoid, uh, the upper abdomen, and connect to their freedom driver. So that is what the artificial heart looks like if we crack it open. It's basically a bulb. It's a circle that has polyurethane membrane in the middle of it. Um, the patient side of that is will the, where the blood will be. And on the other side is where air will be. The freedom driver that you see here is a face, basically a fancy air compressor. What it does is it shoots air from the compressor up to the ventricles and completely ejects the ventricles. So it lifts the diaphragm up pushing all the blood out, and then the air shuttles out of there, diaphragm drops and fills with blood. Surgically, we cut both ventricles off, we cut all four valves out, and then we anastomose these plastic ventricles to, um, to the atria. So plastic ventricles, no tissue for their ventricles. Um, the CCs that you might see on here, that's how much blood actually can fit in each bulb or in each ventricle. Ideally, we don't want them to fill all the way to their maximum, so 70 cc's are what our patients have. We don't want them to fill all that because there's no way they're gonna actually eject it all and we can have risk for clotting, but that's not the kind of stuff that you guys need to know at this particular moment. Um, this is a little bit of an image of what I was just saying about air coming in and out to provide that cardiac output. So the little yellow, that's our ventricle, so air comes out, the diaphragm drops, passive filling from the atria, air shuttles back in, pushes the diaphragm up, and then ejects the blood out to the rest of the body, providing their cardiac output. We call this their beat rate, all right? How many times a minute this happens is called their beat rate. And because they don't have muscle tissue there anymore, their beat rate is their, is their heart rate. So if you're gonna go and palpate a pulse, it's gonna be whatever we set the machine at. Questions on how that kind of works. I know it's weird. And I'll do some highlight of patient management stuff on that too. Okay, so LVADs versus TAH. On the left, we have our VADs and on the right, we have our artificial hearts. So I'm gonna focus on the artificial heart a little bit since we just talked all those LVAD stuff. So the artificial heart is pulsatile, right? We're pushing that air out. Um, Every, every time that ejects, every time the freedom driver goes, we're pushing air out, we're providing an artificial pulse for this patient. Um, typically, our beat rate are, is set about 125, 135, so their heart rate will be anywhere from 125 to 135. There's no EKG tracings because there's no ventricles, so there's no electrical system, all right? So we don't even put them on the monitor. Pulse ox is accurate because it's a pulsatile device. We do have these patients use nitroglycerin for a systolic blood pressure of over 140. Hypertensive crisis is a big problem for these patients, okay? This little, come on, this little freedom driver, which is not a good picture of it, will it only provide so much power when pushing the blood out. So if we're systemically hypertensive and that aortic arch is really tight, no matter how hard the freedom driver tries, it's not gonna be able to overcome pressure of about 140, 150. And once we start dancing in that area, there's a chance that the driver will just stop. 
So if the driver, we talked LVAD, if the LVAD stops, the heart's still gonna squeeze. If the artificial heart stops, what do we think's going on with, what could happen with the patient? They're gonna die. No circulation. Yeah. To say it plainly, yes. So if the device stops, their heartbeat stops. Okay, you can consider them asystolic. But because these are big old plastic ventricles, do you think you're gonna be able to do chest compressions? Nope. Negative. Correct. So no EKG, no chest compressions, no electrical rhythm, so no defibrillation or cardioversion. Um, Usually when we have when you respond to these patients, so you're still gonna call us, just so you guys know, we're the only artificial heart center in the state. So all those patients belong to us, they're not gonna go anywhere else. Um, when you go in and see this patient, first assessment is gonna be, is the driver on? Is the, is the pump on? If the pump's on, it's something else going on with the patient. If the pump is off, we will be on the phone hopefully already with the family, if not with you, and making sure that they're switching the patient to their backup equipment to get it going. That Freedom Driver, they have about, um, they have two to three of those extra at home. So if something were to happen, they're prepared to exchange it. And actually when we do their teaching, we say when your driver stops and you have to change it, not if, because at some point they all have to change their driver. They're pretty sensitive to blood pressure, um, fluid overload, valsalva maneuver, and um, ch severe change of intrathoracic pressure. So the Freedom Driver has audible alarms, or is audible. Um, you don't need to hear a stethoscope to hear. You're going to walk in the house and hear it beating at um, 125 to 135 a minute. Um, or it's going to be screaming and they can't be silenced. So you'll know right away if it's on or not. Um, but you can use a manual cuff or an automatic blood pressure cuff for these patients. Because they're pulsatile, they have the systolic pressure, a diastolic pressure, they're going to have an accurate blood pressure. Quick equipment. This is what a HeartMate 2 system looks like. The pump is in the chest. They all wear external batteries and then a controller that connects to the batteries as well as the drive line leading up. The HeartMate 3 is a little bit smaller and it sits right against the ventricle, whereas the HeartMate 2 sits below in a little surgical pocket. Still connects to a controller outside of the body as well as two batteries. And then our HVAD system or hardware, still at LVAD, same concept, pump is in the left ventricle. We have our drive line, which connects to a controller and two batteries. Very, very important. So we kind of made this little slide as to what the devices, what you're gonna see is the outside. Um, so on the left is the hardware HVAD. The black thing is the system controller. You see the two gray batteries and then the drive line is in that one, okay? Important that we never pull that drive line out. There's also a cover on it that's not pictured here. So it's not just gonna pop out. It's gonna require a manipulation to do so. Um, this hardware HVAD right here, this is the one I had mentioned that if both batteries are disconnected, the pump stops. But realistically, make sure everything has two power sources connected, okay? Um, the patient might be connected to, rather than a second battery, they might be connecting to a wall, an AC power cord. So like I mentioned, use your family, have them put the power source on for you, okay? Then the HeartMate 2 and 3 on the right, <clears throat> We have our system controller with that blue face, the drive line which connects to the patient, two power cords that connect to um, batteries. This device, the HeartMate 2 and 3, they have a 15 minute internal backup battery. So if for some reason both batteries were disconnected, it will still run the pump for about 15 minutes, but you don't wanna actually have to do that. So just always think two power sources, no matter what. Um, patients wear their equipment differently. Some people wear like a little belt. Some people wear it in a purse. Some people wear like these Under Armour concealed ammo weapons shirts and slide everything into it. A couple of our guys wear football pants. So you might not actually see their equipment when you um, when you go in and see them. We want to make sure their equipment and transport though is protected and not stressing on the drive line, right? Not tugging on the belly. 
Um, and then patients all have an extra bag with their emergency equipment. Um, our Australian patient has dubbed it his oh shit bag. So when he goes, oh shit, I need something out of there. It's a bad situation. So they all have an extra system controller and power sources in their bag. They're supposed to take that with them everywhere they go. Um, that needs to go in the ambulance with them when they go, when they're being transported, okay? If you don't have that and something happens to the controller while you're in transport, we're kind of up a creek. So very important that that bag goes with the patient. Oh, those are just some people wearing their devices in different ways. <clears throat> So this is what the HVAD screen will look like. That triangle in the middle is the alarm indicator that will flash red or yellow, depending on your alarm status. Right on the front there, you can see how fast the motor is spinning at RPM, how many liters a minute of output they're getting, and how much power it takes. Um, if you're having an alarm, that screen will, the top line will read what the alarm is, and the bottom line will read the troubleshooting. Um, you can also see there's battery indicators, all these devices, their, their batteries last for about 12 hours, a set of them. So hopefully by the time you've made it there, you're not having to do anything with the power. Um, ideally, we will have got that fixed before you got in, before you got into the house and have the, the family get the patient kind of pre-packed up. This is the HeartMate. Um, HeartMate 2 and 3 have almost identical system controller coloring and all the functionality is the same. So you can see the grayed out lights. Those will all flash if you're having an alarm. Um, that pump running symbol, that green spinning arrow, that's telling us that the device is on. So if you're ever concerned, like your patient suddenly loses consciousness and you go, shit, like is their pump working? You can also tape, but you can also pull out the device and look at that and see if you see a pump running symbol. If those arrows are green, your device is on and running. For HVAD, if you see um, if you see lights and numbers on here, then you know the device is working. Like I said, make sure the patient has two power cord power sources hooked up. They also have a wall power source that they might be on, but will help guide you to hooking up to the batteries if needed. Then our Freedom Driver, so that's what it looks like outside of a bag. It weighs about 12 pounds and connects to our artificial heart. The artificial heart that's laying on its side, you can see all four plastic valves that we put inside the patient. So that's what they actually look like. Um, batteries for the Freedom Driver only last about two hours. So the patient needs to make sure that when they're being transported, um, we have them have one of those like rolling black cubes kind of with a handle um, to have their extra drivers in as well as their wall plug. So they need to be plugged in all the time. They plug in at home, they plug in in, the, in public, they need to plug in into the ambulance. They also have extra batteries. So they have about six hours of battery life in total, but ideally we want them to be plugged in. Um, you can see the front of the screen there. That's what it will look like when you want to see your numbers. So the BPM on the far left, that's our beat rate. That's We set that number, how many times a minute that driver is going to move, shuttle that air in and out of the ventricles. Then we have our fill volume, which is how much blood is going in and out of the ventricles every beat. And then our cardiac output, so calculated cardiac output for the patient. We like that output to be greater than five. So if you call us and it's a Freedom Driver patient, we're going to have you hit that little gray button on the side, and we're going to ask you to read us those numbers. You don't necessarily need to know how to interpret them. That's our job, but you'd hit that gray button right there. Unfortunately, alarms are not able to be silenced on the Freedom Driver. Um, so there's a chance that you and I will be yelling over the sound at each other on the phone. Okay. Um, that little caution triangle light there right underneath the display screen, that is our that is our red alarm indicator. That will be either flashing red or solid red, depending on the alarm, um, if it's going off. So when you call us, that will be a question that we have. Are any of the lights in the front on? Are there any alarms? So they have a total of six batteries. Two batteries last about two hours. Um, they always carry additionally fully charged batteries as well as plugs. 
Um, when you plug it in, the there will be a green light on the power brick of the AC supply. They have both two prong and three prong, so I don't know what kind of power source you guys tend to have in the rig, but that would be the, the two plug options. The device plugs into the side of the Freedom Driver. It has a green outline around the plug, and then the insertion piece also has a green end. So um, green to green, and then your little light on the side will turn on if you're powering. So the Freedom Driver kind of acts like a car battery where that if it's plugged in, it is charging the batteries in the driver, if that makes sense. However, if, that, if they're too low and they're alarming and you plug it in, the alarm won't stop until they've gone above their threshold. So we might just advise you to change them out one at a time slowly um, anyways, because it's real loud and annoying. So routine, routine calls and transport. Call the VAT hotline as soon as you can. Um, get an EKG if you need to, administer O2, start an IV. Like we talked about the blood pressure, so visually assess your patient, okay? So your visual assessment is gonna be key here. Physical assessment is the most important. Um, ensure that the bag containing the backup, so the O shit bag goes with the patient, or if they have an artificial heart that all their backup equipment goes to. If a trained family member or caregiver is present, allow them to ride if possible. I know right now that that's not really a possibility, but hopefully that will change eventually. Um, but bring that resource with you if you can. They're all trained on how to deal with these emergencies. And then, like I said, call that hotline. Usually we will call. So if you're at the house and you call us, we will say, okay, I'm going to call the ER and let them know that you guys are coming. So they're typically prepared for you when you come in before you, e you even call them. We let them know. Emergency response, okay, patients unconscious, you're going to treat them like other patients, right? Make sure that they're at rescue breathing airway. You can establish either an OPA or intubate as needed. Um, then we, we do our verify pump is on versus off, okay, just like you would verify a pulse. So look at your device, look at your patient, also tape. If your, if your pump um, is on, continue airway support. Assess your rhythm, assess your blood pressure if possible, get an IV, IV or um, code drugs as indicated. But if your pump is off, okay, let's figure out why. Is it because there's no power to it? Is it because the drive line's disconnected? Is it because the drive line's cut? Um, we'll help you assess that and address it. Um, but again, you can auscultate or look at the front of the drive of the controller. And then we're always here to help with triaging and advise on equipment related interventions. I will be honest, um, in the two years, almost three years I've been doing this now, the um, VAT, LVAD failure is extremely unlikely. The pumps just don't stop running, okay? Artificial heart, that Freedom Driver is very sensitive. We call it a little Tonka truck and, or Fisher-Price toy, and that might need to be changed, but most of the time for the LVAD patients, it's a patient problem, not a pump problem, okay? We will help you identify if it is or not. All right. What do you guys have questions? Sorry, I know I just kind of blabbered through the hour. Yeah, Lucy, I've got a question. You guys are the yeah. only um, freedom driver hotline coordinators in this state, so you know how many patients that have these installed um artificial hearts of those people and their patients in this state how many are in the east valley um you're gonna hate me when i say all of them <laughs> um we have one who's actually in surprise and we've trained the airy vac crew out there then we have one that's currently still in the hospital but his address is in mesa and then we have a female who has been on support for over a year who lives in mesa And then those are the only three in the state, so. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and the, the gal who's been, who lives in Mesa, she has definitely been transported by EMS before. She had a driver failure, um, was intubated. We were really afraid she wasn't gonna wake up. And then by the time we met her in the ER and she was wheeling and sitting up on the stretcher talking to us. 
So the faster we can intervene on those artificial heart patients and get that pump running appropriately, typically they're going to do fine. Okay. Is there any way you can let our agency know where these patients live? Yes, actually, we already do that. So part of our discharge process is um, we send letters to nearest fire, EMS, um, and hospital um, based on the patient's address of who would be responding to them, that they have a device that is life-sustaining. This is what it is. We typically send some handout information um, to them as well at the time. Eric, we do get that information, and that's one of the only things that we will put into CAD for um, any kind of medical conditions. So we do get that information, and it's in CAD. Yeah, I just thought it'd be uh, really good if we had some heads up, just so we know if you're in our first due or second due, that yep. we'd be better prepared should an yes. incident happen. That's all. Hey, Chief Brigett, um, I believe there's an address in Station 2, uh, the patient being in the Station two's first due, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, there is N6. So, I, and I don't know about all of them, but we, we have been notified and we do have it in CAD. So, um, Bo, do you, do you recall um, getting the notification in CAD or you guys being aware in route? Um, just cause I'm in the back, I don't ever see the CAD. So I'm not too sure if we did. We haven't run on the patient. I just, uh, being at station two, I've seen it written on the board with the address. Yeah, um, that's and just kind of where where to look out for, but I just knew that was in station two's first due was one of them. Yeah, thanks, Bo. And that's that's one thing too is Ryan will reach oh. out to the station and get it put, put out there. The insurance people. We also have a a patient in bordering station six and station eight. Um, yep. We actually uh, rendered care to that gentleman about a week ago. And uh, oh yes, and he's doing fine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So yes, you've had a little bit of experience. That patient fell and um, hit his head at dialysis on the glass door. And he was very naughty and didn't have caregivers with him like he is supposed to. They're supposed to have caregivers 24 hours a day in case that device shuts off. Um, we've had some social issues, so he's been kind of stuck living with us in the hospital, but clinically he's fine. Very good. I, I, believe, I believe our patient had a uh, significant GI bleed. I don't recall the patient having a fall issue, uh, he presented with us in the evening with a GI issue. Oh, he is also fine and has gone home. The other one. We have a few out in Mexico. I'm going to get a new I can speak to that patient with the GI, I believe his wife came by the station about a week later and um, was concerned about our level of training and whether you folks had contacted us or not. Uh, we assured her that we had been contacted. Do we know if there's any concerns with, their, um, with that gentleman's in-home care? His wife seemed very concerned that we needed some uh, additional training. She is wonderful. So she actually, you guys can expect at that station, she asked that I send her. You can do it any way that works for you. I, I do it a little bit differently. I look at how much... I should spend, or I'm, I'm budgeted to spend. Hey, I'm George. Like, and I use that number rather than, George. because the, the George. way I look at that is. George, you're talking about budget to the whole entire class. Okay, um, <laughs> thank you. So actually I spoke with that patient's wife. I've been talking to her um, daily actually. And cause I know she just moved to that address and she's worried he's had his device a long time. He's very frail. So she asked that I send her a manual and some alarm guides. So you guys can expect her to drop off a little care package at that station with some resources as well as some discs about his specific device per her request. So I actually put those in the mail this morning. Okay, but for the crews that are at station eight where they're close to, um, it is his in-home care adequate? I guess that's what I'm trying to nicely ask. Do, does she? Oh, she is wonderful. She takes great care of him. And then it, they removed seemed, him with her daughter too. Yeah, it seemed like their care was um, uh, excellent. Uh, it seemed like when I read the notes, he had his LVAD or his device since 2014. Uh, the one thing we did not do was we did not notify the coordinator. Uh, we made sure his batteries and his backup uh, were available um, in transport with him. And we, uh, we discussed with Banner University 
but we did not contact the coordinator. That That is something that we will be doing moving forward that in route um, and during the call, we will contact the coordinator to make sure that that, that care is seamless. Perfect. And then we had, we actually were able, we spoke with the patient's wife before she called you guys. So we were aware that he was being transported um, and that he was going. So, but good job moving forward. You guys are wonderful. We appreciate you all so much. These patients are not always easy to care for. And the older they get, the more complex comorbidities they have, um, the more we might see them for various reasons. So we greatly appreciate all the support that they get in the community from you guys. So thank you, thank you.